Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazhar, and today is fifteenth of September, two thousand and twenty-one. Right now, I am with the eleven Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is physics five zero five four. This is all levels physics, and today we have set our hearts to solve uh, October November two thousand and five paper one. We call it winter two thousand and five paper one. This is an MCQ paper, and this is the second. Uh, video on this paper you can say this is the part b or on this paper and in part a we have already uh, solved from question number 1 to question number 20 and i have uploaded that in my youtube channel you can watch that uh, in this video in this session we will be working from question number 21 to question number 40 okay so let's start and let's go to the question number uh, Question number twenty-one. Uh, okay, so on your screen, the question number twenty-one is showing up. He says the dipper in a ripple tank vibrates at a frequency of four hertz, and the resulting wave pattern is photographed. The distance between the two crusts shown is twenty centimeter. So, what is the speed of the wave? So, the frequency of the wave is given. That is four hertz, and this this distance twenty centimeter. How many waves are there? One, two, three, four, five. So in twenty centimeter there are five waves. So I can find the wavelength. Divide the distance with the five, so you will get the wavelength of one wave. And once you have the frequency and the wavelength, you can find the speed. The formula is very simple. Famous formula wave equation V equals to f lambda. So once you have that formula, then very easily you can find out. Let me show you how this is done. So here we go. So on your screen you can see that the uh, wavelength will be equals to twenty centimeter divided by five. that will give you 4 cm so the lambda is 4 cm the frequency is 4 hertz so i will apply the wave equation v equals to f lambda and uh, v equals to f lambda f is 4 hertz lambda is 4 cm for for the 16 so your answer will be 16 cm per second 16 cm per second So that was the question number twenty-one, sixteen centimeter per second. So let's check what is the option. So I think sixteen centimeter per second. I think that uh, C is the right answer. Question number twenty-one. I think C is the right answer. Let's check. Question number twenty-one. I think C is the right answer. Good. C is the right answer for question number sixteen. Uh, question number twenty-one. Sorry. So let's move to the next question. The next question showing up on your screen is question number twenty-one. Which characteristic dis characteristics describe an image formed in a plane mirror? So in the plane mirror, the image formed is virtual. The image formed is erect or upright. The image formed has the same size as that of the object. the distance of the image from the mirror and the distance of the object from the mirror they both are equal to each other the image is laterally inverted so look at the options real and inverted that's wrong the image formed is virtual virtual and upright yes this it can be the answer real and real is not the answer virtual and smaller than the object no is the size of the image and the size of the object they are equal to each other in the plane mirror So I think B is the right answer. Question number twenty-two. B is the right answer. So let's check from the marking scheme. Question number twenty-two. B is the right answer. Okay. So let's move to the next part. The question number twenty-three is showing up on your screen. The diagram shows an object O placed three centimeter away from a converging lens of the focal length six centimeter. uh you know the focal length is 6 cm the distance of the object from the lens uh, from the lens is only 3 cm which means that the object is inside the focal length 
if the object is inside the focal length the image uh, the convex lens will make a virtual image and a magnified image the convex lens will act like a magnifying glass a virtual and enlarged and magnified image will be formed so and that will be the virtual the image formed will be virtual it will be erect upright and it will be magnified virtual erect and magnified so these are the what type of images produced it will be virtual erect and magnified i think c is the right answer question number 23 question number 23 c is the right answer sir okay so let's move to the next question the next question is showing up on your screen and the question 24 wave forms are shown on uh, on an oscilloscope for a flute and a basin basin are playing the same note the oscilloscope settings are the same for both wave forms what is the difference between the two sounds you see if you check at uh, for example if i try to check the time period one two three four one two three four so four squares for the time period on the x-axis for this wave one two three and four it's four so they have the same time period if they have the same time period the frequency will be also same from the mean position how high they went one two three three point eight this is also one two three three point eight so they both have the same amplitude they have the same time period they have the same frequency it means so what's the difference between them the basic shape of the waves is different from each other they have the same time period they have the same frequency they have the same amplitude the only difference between these waves is that their uh, wave form the basic fundamental wave that is different the shape the note is different from each other the shape of the wave is different from each other. That is called the quality, timber. So the quality is different. So C is the question, and this is a very, very famous and frequently asked question. Question number 24, C is the choice. Question number 24, C is the right choice, sir. So let's move to the next question. Question 25 is showing up on your screen. A student tries to magnetize the short steel rod. Which of these tests will show that he has been successful? A student tries to magnetize a short steel rod. Which of the, these tests will show that he has been successful? He was trying to magnetize a steel rod. If they were trying to magnetize a steel rod, so they will be successful if the steel rod is magnetized. So what is the test for a thing to, to check if that is magnetized or not? That it, it one end should repel, uh, it should have a repulsion between uh, a North Pole. For example, one end should be attracted to the North Pole and the other end of this steel rod should be repelled by the North Pole. Okay. So repulsion is the confirmed test if for a thing to be magnet. So if a steel rod is magnetized, it will be its one end, one of its end. If we are testing only one end of this rod, one of its end, uh, uh, end will be attracted to the north and one of its end will be repelled by the north. In the same way, one of its, it will have two ends. One end will be attracted to the south. The other end will be repelled. So that repulsion is basically, it will be repelled by a, another magnet. Both ends of a permanent magnet attract the rod. That does not mean it's magnetized. One end of a permanent magnet repels the rod. Yes, that can be the answer. The rod picks up small pieces of paper. That is not a confirmed test that... Uh, it is magnetized when freely suspended the rod points in any direction no that cannot be characteristic characteristic of a magnetized rod so um, they say that uh, the student tries to 
so i think the rod uh, the one end of a permanent magnet repels the rod yes that is that is the repulsion is actually the test that if something is magnetized or it is not magnetized so that was question number uh, uh, 25 and we think that uh, b is the right answer question number 25 our guess is that the b is the right answer so if you open the marking scheme question number 25 b is the right answer sir now now we are on the question number 26 uh, four processes are used to charge an isolated metal sphere p the sphere is earth by touching it the q is the earth connection to remove from the sphere the chai rod is brought close to the sphere and s is the chai rod is removed in which order should these processes be carried out so let me show you let me write here uh, okay so let me bring it here so first of all what we do we take a isolated metal rod and we bring another charged rod near it so a charged rod is brought close to the sphere so first of all the r is done then um the uh, then we the sphere is earth by the uh, the sphere is earth by touching it yes we do this this p and then we break the earth the earth connection is removed from the sphere yes then the q thing is done the q thing okay and then what we do uh, we remove the charge that charge rod the charge rod is removed yes then the s is done s is done so this is how you do it you do r p q s r p q s r p q s that should be the okay so rpqs so i mean that uh, it means rpqs c looks the right answer sir question number 28 c looks the right answer so let's check if the our answer is right question number 26 c is the choice question number 26 c is the choice <sighs> so on your screen question number 27 is showing up why why can bird stand on an overhead high voltage transmission line without suffering any harm you see uh, you get electrocuted when you uh, one one part of your body is at uh, high voltage and the and any other part of your body touch a uh, low voltage so when you are when you are connected with the both high voltage and low voltage then the electricity will flow through the flow through you or through flow through the bird and it will be electrocuted if your whole body is in contact with the high voltage line but your body is not in contact with any other object which is at low voltage then you will be not electrocuted so the options are their bodies have a very high resistance no their feet are very good insulators no the spaces between their feathers act as insulators no they are not connected to the earth yes that can be the answer because they are not connected to the low voltage so that's why they are not electrocuted because they are not question number 27 d is the answer yes sir question number 27 d is the right answer okay so let's move to the question number 28 the diagram shows a cell connected in series with an m with an ammeter and three resistors 10 ohm 20 ohm and 30 ohm the circuit can be completed by a movable contact m when the m is connected to x the ammeter reads 0.6 ampere what is the ammeter reading when the m is connected to y okay so uh, first it was connected here the the resistance of the circuit was 10 ohm 
and the reading on the ammeter the current in the circuit was 0.6 ampere so by using this information i will be able to find out the emf of this battery then they connected it at y the total resistance uh, in the circuit will become 30 I, i i already calculated the emf of the battery that will remain same so very easily i can find out the the current coming from the battery the reading on the ammeter let me show you my calculation i have done this on a paper so here we go so here we have the question number 28 is coming up on your screen when the movable contact m was put on x the the uh the resistance of the circuit was only 10 ohm and the current in the circuit was 0.6 ampere so how much is the emf i is equals to emf by the total resistance so put this values i is 0.6 emf is question the total resistance of the circuit is 10 so emf will be 10 multiplied 0.6 and that will give you 6 volt so now i know the emf of that cell now what they did they put the movable contact on the y now you can see that the total resistance of the circuit has become 30 ohm 10 plus 20 that's 30 ohm the total resistance of the circuit is 30 ohm the emf of the battery connected there is uh, 6 volt and i want to know how much current is coming from the battery in other words what is the reading on the ammeter so i is equal to emf by the total resistance of the circuit So six divided by thirty that gives you one by five, which is equal to zero point two ampere. So the reading on the ammeter will be zero point two ampere. The reading on the ammeter will be zero point two ammeter. So I hope that you have understood this question. So so let's uh, let's do let's check zero point. Okay, so our option is zero point two ampere. So we think this is the option. Question number twenty eight. We think B is the right option. So let's check if our answer is right or not. Question number twenty eight, sir. B is the right answer. Question number twenty eight. B is the right answer. You can see from the marking scheme. So uh, let's go back to the question. Question number twenty-eight is done. Now we are on the question number twenty-nine. Okay, he says in the circuit shown, the battery lights up all four lamps. The battery lights up all four lamps. When one of the lamps filament melts, the other three lamps stay on. Which filament melts? Okay. so they are connected in you can see here we have uh, three four lamps a b c d so during the our experiment one of them melted so one of them mel melted the path of the current is broken but the the three others are still uh, giving light so which one is melted so we are looking for that lamp that if the path of the current is broken at that point the rest of the three will be getting the current they will be switched on so i think very easily we can tell if the lamp b if the lamp b will if the lamp b will do you see this lamp the lamp b if it melts if the path of the current is broken here the a c and d they are they will be in a single loop and they will be connected with the battery and they will still be lit So I think B is melted. Question number twenty nine. I think B is melted. So let's check. Question number twenty nine. B is the right answer. So I hope you have understood. Okay. So here we go. Question number twenty thirty. A combined bathroom unit of a heater and a lamp is controlled by one switch. so there is a single switch for a heater and a lamp so whenever you switch on the lamp the heater is automatically switched on or you switch on the lamp uh, the heater the lamp is off they are working on the same a single switch so when you open that switch the both are off when you close that switch they both are open so if you are using the lamp it means you are also using the heater he says the unit contains a 2 kilowatt heater and a 100 watt lamp in one week the lamp uses 
one kilowatt hour electric energy. So I know that how much energy is being used by the lamp. I know the power of the lamp. That is uh, 100 watt. So from these two informations, the power of the lamp, which is 100 watt, and the electric energy used by the lamp, I will able to, I will calculate for how much for how long the lamp is switched on. So and then the same time the heater will be switched on for the same time as well. So how much electric energy used by the heater alone? I know the power of that. I only want to know how much time for how much time it has been switched on. OK, so let's uh, see. I have done this question. So. On your screen, the question number 30 is showing up. The lamp, first of all, we are talking about the lamp. The lamp, its power is 100 watt. I converted into kilowatts for converting watt into kilowatts. You divide with 1000. So 100 divided by 1000, that will be 0 0.1 kilowatt. And the energy used by the lamp is 1 kilowatt hour. You know the energy is equal to power multiplied time. And in this formula, you know the power is in kilowatts. The time is in hours. So E is equal to 1 kilowatt hour. The P is 0 0.1 kilowatt. The time is question. So 1 equals to 0 0.1 multiplied T. I will take this 0 0.1, which is multiplying with the T to the other side. And it will divide there. So when I will divide 1 with the 0 0.1, the answer will be 10 hours. It's, it means that the lamp is used for 10 hours. And you know that the lamp and the heater, they both were connected with the same switch. So if the lamp is on, the heater is also on. So now I know that the heater is of uh, 2 kilowatt. And the time for which the heater is uh, used is 10 hours. So how much electric energy is used? Electric energy used is equal to power multiplied time. The power must be in the kilowatts. And the time must be in hours. So 2 kilowatt, well, that's the power of the electric heater. The time is 10 hours. You just multiply them. You will get 20 kilowatt hour. So the electric energy used by the, the electric energy used by the uh, heater is 20 kilowatt. 20 kilowatt. So let's, let's see. 20 kilowatt is our answer. Do we have this answer here? OK, so D is the choice. Question number 30, D is the right choice. So let's check. Let's check if this is the answer or not. Question number, two, sorry, I said 20. This was the question number. Question number 30, sorry. Question number 30, D is the answer. So our answer is right. By mistake, I said question number 20. OK. So the next question is coming up on your screen. An electric kettle is plugged in and switched on. The fuse in the plug blows immediately. Which fault could cause this? Uh, the fuse is melted. It means there is some short circuit. The earth wire is not connected to the kettle. It has no effect on the fuse. The live wire and the neutral wire connections in the plug are swapped around. So I don't think this will blow up the fuse. The live wire touches the metal case of the kettle. Yes, this can be the reason. Because if the live wire will come in contact with the metal case, and if it has earth wire, then the current will start going into the ground and the amount of current coming from the battery will increase and that can blow the fuse but let's see what's the d option the wires connected to the plug are too thin now so i think the best possible answer looks to me c the live wire touches the metal case of the kettle so due to this the, earth, the current will start going into the current and the amount of current coming from the main supply or the source of electricity will increase because the current is going to the machine plus the current is going to the ground also because the current has started going into the body of the machine. 
and uh, this will increase the amount of current and this will blow the fuse i think c looks to me the best answer uh swapped around let me check first of all question number 31 so question number 31 let me check first let me 31 So C is the answer. Question number thirty-one. C is the right answer, sir. Okay. Question number thirty-one is the right answer. So we are moving to the question number thirty-two. A coil carrying a current is arranged within a magnetic field. The coil experiences forces that can make it move. In which direction does the coil move? So see, uh, so here we have a coil, and this coil has two turns, and it has it is in the magnetic field, and the current is flowing in that coil. So the sides of the coil, uh, which are left sides, in them the current is going towards the top of the page, and the side of the coil, which is on the right, in that the current is coming towards the bottom of the page. so if you apply the left hand rule uh, so on the left side of the coil if i apply the left hand rule and the left hand rule says take your left hand stretch the fingers of the left hand in such a way so f m c uh, force magnetic field and the current the current is going upward and the magnetic field in the left side of the coil the magnetic field is going from left to right the thumb is pointing towards me so it means that the coil will come out of the paper that this side of the coil will come out of the paper in the same way the right side of the coil that will move into the paper so because this coil is uh, has an uh, axis uh, xy is the axis so the left side is experiencing a force which is out of the paper and the right side is experiencing a force which is into the paper so this coil will start rotating about the x y axis so this coil will start rotating uh, clockwise uh, it will start rotating clockwise i think that uh, about the axis x x y so i think d is the best answer so this coil will start rotating x y d question number 32 d is the answer yes sir question number 32 d is the right answer okay the question number 33 is coming up on your screen a magnet is pushed horizontally towards a coil of insulated wire inducing an emf in the coil so this is the very famous experiment in which you have a coil it does not have any kind of emf or current in it so what you do you take a magnet and you move the magnet uh, either you move it towards the coil or you move it away from the coil so what will happen the due to the movement of the magnet the due to the movement of the magnet so what will happen the emf or the current will be induced in the coil so you see you see the the emf is induced in the coil so in which direction does the emf uh, uh, emf make the coil move so the coil will always try to oppose the motion of the magnet so the coil the emf will the current which is induced in the in the in the coil will make this coil move uh, to oppose the motion of the magnet so if the magnet is coming closer to the coil the coil will try to move away from the magnet so in which direction does the induced emf make the coil move away from the magnet towards the magnet downwards upwards it will try to oppose the cause which is producing that emf that's the lenz's law so the coil will move away from the magnet so i think question number 33 i think that the question number 33 a is the answer question number 33 a is the answer that's the lenz's law a is the right answer sir 
the current which is produced in the em and the coil is such that it tries to oppose the cause which is producing it so that was question number 33 okay so on your screen question number 34 is showing up a step up transformer with 100 percent efficiency has an input voltage of 3 volt and an out input current of 2 ampere so here you have a transformer uh, you under these conditions what output voltage and output current could be obtained so you see clearly you can see the number of turns on the primary side are are four and the number of turns of the coil on the secondary side they are eight so you can count them so uh, in the primary coil the voltage is 3 volt and the current in the primary coil is 2 ampere their question is what will be the uh, voltage in the secondary coil and what will be the current in the secondary coil and we have just counted how many turns are in the primary coil there are four and how many turns are there in the secondary coil they are eight so what we will do, uh, we will do this a little bit calculation. Let me show you my calculation. I've done that. Okay. So so that is showing up on your screen. Let me. Uh oh. So I think. Let me. Let me do that. So. Sorry, I think I forgot to put the rest of the figures. But let me show you. I will show you. The okay. So I have done this on a paper. Let me show you that. And so here we go. So this is winter 2005, question number 34. Sorry, I forgot to put this in my PowerPoint presentation. So uh, in the question number 34, you can see the voltage in the primary is 33 volt. The number of turns in the primary are four. The current in the primary, there are two amperes. What is the voltage in the secondary? The voltage in the secondary, uh, that's the famous formula, voltage in the secondary divided by the voltage in the primary is equal to the number of turns in the secondary divided by the number of turns in the primary. So voltage in the secondary is the question. The voltage in the primary is 3. The number of turns in the secondary are 8. And number of turns in the primary are 4. So just do this calculation. You will get the voltage in the secondary will be 6 volt. And then the, we have the next formula. And the next formula is uh, you can... Uh, where we have to find out the current in the secondary current we have we can find out the current in the secondary and uh, the current in the primary is given the formula famous formula is by ip is equals to np by ns remember this here if the vs is upstairs the ns is also upstairs but in the current formula the is is upstairs then the ns will be downstairs so that's the difference between them. Okay, so the IS is the question. The IP is 2 amperes. The NP is 4 and the NS is 8. So just do this calculation. So the current in the secondary will be 1 ampere. So the voltage in the secondary will be 6 volt and the current in the primary will be 1 ampere. So the voltage will be 6 and the current will be 1 ampere. It's a step up transformer and the voltage is supposed to increase so i think d is the right answer question number 34 d is the right answer let's check question number 34 d is the right answer so question number 35 is coming up on your screen and uh, why is a read relay used in a switching circuit to read relay is used as uh, that the circuit which is connected with the read relay, the circuit of the read relay has a very low voltage and a very small amount of the current which actually operates the read relay. 
and the read relay then operates another circuit and, and that circuit has very high voltage and very large amount of current so to switch on a small current using a large current no to switch on a small voltage using a large voltage no to switch on a large current using a small current yes that is the purpose of the read relay the switch of the read relay the the switch op which operates the read relay has very low current and very low voltage but the read relay then switch on and off another circuit which has very high voltage and very high very large amount of current <coughs> so i think c is the choice question number 35 c is the choice yes so we move to the next question question number 36 a potential divider consists of an ldr ldr means light dependent resistor and a resistor connected to a 6 volt battery so what should be the resistance of the ldr for the output uh, for the output to be 3 volt so here the this is a potential divider r1 is fixed it has it is resistance is 10000 ohm r2 is question the resistance of the ldr we know that the v out from the r2 is 3 the voltage of the battery is 6 volt if you remember the famous formula the famous famous formula of the potential divider so oh, sorry i am not here so if you remember that formula okay so this is coming up on your screen that's question number 36 coming up on your screen you see the r1 value is 10000 ohm and r2 value is question v out from the r2 is 3 volt and the voltage of the battery is 6 volt you know the famous formula of the potential divider v out is equals to r2 divided by r1 plus r2 and the whole thing multiply with the voltage of the battery r2 suppose is x r1 is 10000 and r2 is x okay and the v out is 3 volt the voltage of the battery is 6 just substitute those values in that formula now you see we cross multiplied it so you will have 30000 plus 3x equals to 6x so take this 3x to the other side so you will have 6x minus 3x so you will have 3x equals to 30000 x will be equals 30000 divided by 3 and x will be equals to 10000 ohm ohm so it means that the r2 is also 10000 ohm it means the resistance of the ldr will be 10000 ohm or in other word you can say it will be like uh, 10k ohm so c is the right choice the resistance of the ldr it will be 10000 ohm c question number 36 we think c is the right option yes question number 36 c is the right option okay so let's move to the next question the next question is question number 37 the diagram shows the apparatus used in an experiment in which barriers of various materials are placed in turn between different radioactive sources and a detector okay so here we have a radioactive source this is the detector the gm tube geiger muller tube and this tells you how much radiation is coming here we will put some barriers between them so the table shows the count rates recorded by the detector for the four sources so you have put four different sources which source emits alpha particles only so if Uh, a, a source is uh, giving out alpha particles so when you will put a paper between uh, gm tube and the source the reading should not change and when you put uh, aluminum foil then the reading should fall down to the background radiation and when you put a thick lead then the reading should be again only background radiation so this will show that only the beta particles are given sorry sorry we were looking for i told you the the test for the beta particle this is which source emits alpha particles sorry so source which is only emitting alpha particles uh, when you will put a paper the reading will drop to the uh background when you will put aluminum 
the reading will be still background and when you put a lead sheet the reading will be still background okay so because the alpha particles they are not able to penetrate through paper so they are also not able to able to penetrate through uh, aluminum and plus they are also not uh, able to penetrate through the lead so that source will be emitting alpha particles only who give some reading uh, when there is nothing between the um, gm tube and the source but when you put a paper between the source and the gm tube the reading drops to the background so it means there are alpha particles because the alpha particles cannot pass through the uh, pass through the uh, paper and uh, when you put the aluminum foil the alpha particles cannot pass through the aluminum foil the reading it will show when the aluminum is between the in the between the source and the gm tube will be equals to the background and same way when you put a thick lead so you see the source b when there is no barrier when there is no barrier the reading on the gm tube is 200 so when you put the paper the reading drops to 30 so there are alpha particles they have been stopped the reading has dropped so when you put aluminum foil the reading is still 30 the when the reading uh, when you put a thick lead the reading is still 30 this means that this source is only producing alpha particles so i think uh, i think b is the right answer sir b question number 37 b is the right answer okay so we are moving to the next question he says uh, let me uh, increase the size so you can clearly see what we are talking about our nucleus is represented with z91 to 30 it emits one alpha particle and then one beta particle what is the resulting nucleus x so uh, there we have uh, a nucleus whose uh, proton number is 91 mass number is 230 and it gave out alpha particle then it gave out a beta particle then the daughter nucleus is x so we have to decide about the proton number and the uh, mass number of that the daughter nucleus so let me show you how this is done and show you here so okay so on your screen hopefully you can see this so here we have that z91 230 so it gave out an alpha particle the proton proton number of the alpha particle is 2 the mass number of the proton and the alpha particle is 4 so that this daughter nucleus y will be produced the daughter nucleus uh, proton number will be two less than the the parent nucleus and its mass number will be reduced by the four so the y proton y nucleus its uh, proton number will be 89 and its mass number will be 226 then this will give out a beta particle the y will this y nucleus that will give a beta particle when the beta particle is given out when the beta particle is given out the new daughter nucleus which is formed from this daughter nucleus whenever a beta emission happens the proton number increases by one remember this thing whenever the beta particle is given out the proton number will be increased by one and the mass number will not change so the proton number which was 89 now it will become 90 and the mass number will not change so the daughter nucleus x will have proton number 90 and its mass number will be 226 so let's check so let's check what are the options uh 90 and 226 so i think this is the option i think c is the right option it has the 90 and 226 so let's check question number 38 c is the right answer question number 38 c is the right option okay so let's move to the next part it's question number 39 coming up on your screen and this question is a nucleide of the element uh, polonium is 
uh, 94 242 what is the number of neutrons in the nucleus the number of neutrons are very easy to find the number of neutrons are mass number minus the proton number the mass number is 242 the proton number is 94 uh, from the mass number simply subtract the uh, the proton number so you will have 24 plus 94 that will give you the number of neutrons in that nucleus so let's check uh, i have done this on a paper let me show you my work so here we go question number 39 is showing up on your screen you can see that uh, the question number 39 is uh, polonium 242 94 so neutrons will be equals to the mass number minus the proton number 242 minus 94 that will give you 148 so the number of neutrons in the nucleus are 148 so number of the neutrons in the nucleus are 148 hopefully you have understood how we have done this 148 so let's check the options So I think B is the right option. Question number thirty-nine. I think B is the right option. Let's check question number thirty-nine. Question number thirty-nine. I think B is the right option, sir. Which statement defines isotopes? Isotopes have the same are the atoms which have the same proton number but different nucleon number. They have different number of neutrons. So the isotopes have same proton number but different nucle uh, number of neutrons in them. So they have different uh, nucleon number. Or their mass number is different from each other, but their proton number is same. So they are called the isotopes. So A option is two or more nuclides which have the same number of protons, but num different number of electrons. It's not about electrons. Okay, so A is not the option. Two or more nuclides which have the same number of neutrons, but different number of electrons. That's wrong. Two or more nuclides which have the same number of neutrons, but different number of protons. That is also wrong. two or more nuclei which have the same number of protons yes that's the definition of they have the same number of protons but they have different number of neutrons and due to this they have different number of uh, uh nucleon numbers so the isotopes are two atoms which have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons in their nucleus so d looks the best option to me sir question number 40 d is the right option so my dear students uh we are done with the today uh we have done october november 2005 physics 5054 paper 1 and uh, this was the second part of that uh, on on this is the second lecture on this paper in my part a we have done from question number 1 to question number 20 in this part b we have done question 21 to question number 40 i have tried my best uh, to explain the things and to make things easier for my students so hopefully this video is helpful to you and it will benefit you and it will improve your concepts of the uh, all levels physics so thank you very much and it was a pleasure teaching you all thank you very much and uh, Do not forget to subscribe my channel, and if you find this video helpful to to you, also share this video on your Facebook and also share this video on your Instagram, so that uh, my sub subscribers can increase. So thank you very much, and God bless you all.